great pleasure to welcome back um, one extremely old friend, and uh, a more recent friend, Barry Smith and Gilt Landpaper, who recently published a book now called Why Machines Will Never Rule the World. Um, Barry and Gilt are going to summarize some of the main ideas, and then we will start um, discussing different parts of the, of the book. Good. Thank you, Kevin. So it's 50 years, you know that. What is 50 years? Since we have known each other. Really? Yeah. How time flies. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give a very brief uh, summary of the book in simple terms, and then Jobs will give you some of the more technical details. And uh, the main argument of the book is that artificial general intelligence is impossible. Uh, and it's a bit like a perpetual motion machine. So we know that there will never be a perpetual motion machine. Uh, we similarly are in a position now to know that there will never be artificial general intelligence. That's the argument. And the argument is based on a distinction between two kinds of systems. Um, on the one hand, there are simple systems like the uh, solar system uh, or the system which is your laptop or your iPhone. And on the other hand, there are complex systems like your digestive system or your neurological system or the Uzi uh, teaching system, which involves all those people. Uh, anything involving organisms is a complex system. There are complex systems outside the organic realm. For instance, the weather is a complex system. Now, simple systems are such that we can predict their behavior. And we don't build a tool, an artifact, a machine, unless we can predict the behavior of the tool or the artifact or the machine. So all tools, artifacts, machines are simple systems. Otherwise, we wouldn't and we couldn't build them. Now, computers are machines. And we build computers on the basis of the fact that we can predict how they will behave given certain inputs. So computers are simple systems, and now one of the theses of the book is that a, a simple system can never emulate the behavior of a complex system. An artificial general intelligence would have to be a simple system, because it's running in a computer, that's what artificial means. It would have to be a, a system, which is a simple system, which is emulating the behavior of a complex system, probably the most complex single system, namely the human brain. Therefore, by the argument that a simple system can't ever emulate a complex system, there will never be artificial general intelligence. That's a summary of the three parts. So the first part is about the human mind and human language. The second part is about the limits of mathematical models. So a predictive system has to be uh, representable as a mathematical model. And uh, we, we can have mathematical models of complex systems, but if they are predictive, then only in very narrow ways. For instance, I can predict that you will all sleep in the next 36 hours. That's a very, very weak prediction. I can't predict very much about your behavior other than that. And then... Uh, the, the final part is about the limits and potential of AI. So we think that AI has a lot of potential. Um, AI can do amazing things, but always along certain narrow lanes where they are dealing with simple systems. These are all cases where we're doing something like pre predicting what is approximated as a simple system. All right, now... I don't think I need to say very much about the idea of the singularity, except that Elon thinks it's going to happen in two years' time, the latest. Elon is wrong. He's right about most things, but he's wrong about this. Uh, then there is the book by Bostrom. The, the book by Bostrom led to what is the funniest chapter in our book. Um, so Bostrom uh, innocently makes all kinds of... of uh, they're not jokes, but they are funny. So one of his <laughs> predictions is that if we take, I don't know, 100 pairs and have them breed, 
then we can bring about an IQ increase of 43.2 IQ points. That's what, he said. Like. That's what he says. There's no, he doesn't consider the question of compulsorily making people breed to chosen partners in order to bring about this 43.2% increase. But there's an even funnier passage. So this is Bostrom's recommendation, not just for philosophers, but for pure mathematicians. So we can assume that these are the best brains that we have. And we should immediately stop whatever we're doing because we're wasting our time because the bomb is ticking, the, the singularity is nigh. And so we should be working, investing all our energies to support Bostrom in his efforts to prevent the singularity from happening, uh, as documented in the book, in, in, including breeding more intelligent human beings. So, and, and this, is, this choice to immediately stop doing our work is rational because the people who will follow in our wake when we have the singularity with all of these super intelligent machines will be able to do much better work in philosophy and pure mathematics than we can do today. So we should sacrifice our lives for Nick uh, in order to bring about generations in the future who can do our work much better. All right, now the current standard approach to AI, the stochastic approach, is based upon training neural nets. Now, the idea underlying this training neural nets, which the, uh, the computer scientists and engineers like to um, presuppose, is that our brain is a neural net. And so if we can build a neural net which has the same complexity as our brain, then we will have a, a, a computer which has the same or improved intelligence as compared to uh, the intelligence of a human. Um, now, we don't believe that there is uh, any similarity at all between deep neural networks, on the one hand, and the networked structure of our brains. And that, that's a long story, uh, which you can find uh, uh, in, in the book. We're, I'm not going to talk about it now. But certainly we do believe that there are deep neural networks and that these deep neural networks work. In other words, they produce good and interesting and very powerful outcomes. But they do this, now I said earlier, only along certain narrow lanes. I can now specify more carefully what that means. If we want to build a neural net which will predict the behavior of a system, then we have to train that neural net to predict the behavior of that system. Now, what does training mean? Training means that you take sample data from the behavior of the system, and this sample data is then used to program the neural net, to give it the appropriate weights so that it models the behavior of the, the system that it's trying to emulate. Now, this only works if you can collect representative sample data. Now you can do that for the game of Go or for many other kinds of activities where AI has shown successes. But you can't do it, for instance, for the behavior of human beings or the behavior of the stock market or the behavior of the weather. You cannot find sample data which will be representative of the entire domain. Now what this means is that if you want to get representative sample data, then the domain has to have a data distribution. There are different kinds of data distribution, but it has to have a distribution. And the behavior of organisms, for instance, doesn't have a distribution for reasons which uh, Yorks will explain in a few minutes. All right, so we can say now that AI will only work where the data has a regular distribution. And the bell curve is an example of a regular distribution. There are other examples of a regular distribution. Now, this rule that, uh, that stochastic AI will only work in a domain where the data has a regular distribution, um, this is a mathematical fact. And th this mathematical fact will apply to all stochastic AI. It's, a, it's, it's a built into the very 
architecture of stochastic AI that this distribution restraint must hold. And from this it follows that we will never have mathematical algorithms which can run on a computer and which can emulate the behavior of a complex system like a human mind. And that's because the variance of complex systems like the human mind is irregular. And again, Yorks is going to put more flesh on that thesis. You can't get representative sample data from complex systems. The brain is a very complex system which has uh, more than 10 to the 26 atoms. And we don't really know very much about the behavior of the brain at the, le the atomic or molecular level of granularity. We probably never will because we, to do so would involve drilling holes through your skull and, and uh, using uh, imaging instruments which would be orders of magnitude finer in resolution than the imaging instruments that we have today. We lack sample data, but even if we had sample data, it wouldn't be regular data, and so we couldn't use it to train a neural net. Moreover, even if we could have sample data about the dynamics of a, a single human brain, it would be different from the dynamics of every other human brain because they're all different. And again, that's the difference between complex systems and simple systems. All right, so the argument. The variance of complex systems is irregular. Any AI algorithm must be based on a mathematical model. There are no mathematical models for complex dynamic systems. Therefore, there can be no route to AGI unless we can find a route to AGI which would not involve emulating the human mind. And we go in detail in the book through the arguments why there couldn't be other alternative routes to finding an artificial general intelligence which would not involve emulating the behavior of human beings. Therefore, AGI is impossible. Why is the, the idea that a neural network is somehow mimicking the network of the brain? Well, the, the, a new, neural network, the pictures that they draw, pretty pictures of deep neural networks with lots of layers and so forth, are in fact not much more than pretty pictures because the AI algorithm, when it goes to work, is not anything like a brain with connections between neurons. It's a gigantically long polynomial function with billions of parameters. The algorithm has to be like that because it has to operate inside a computer, inside a Turing machine. Computers can operate with extremely long algorithms, providing they are mathematically built out of relatively simple parts. Now, we can use these gigantically long algorithms in software like the, the Google Translate or ChatGPT to do all kinds of wonderful and sometimes tragic things. But we can't use these long algorithms to emulate the behavior of a human mind. And so, because these algorithms are built on the basis of training neural nets in the way that I described, and you can train a neural net only if you have data with a regular distribution and human beings' behavior is not such that we can have data about it with a regular distribution. Okay, now it's your turn. Yours. Okay, so um, Barry introduced us to the difference between complex system and logic system. So the system that we can build ourselves uh, or that we do obtain in mathematics or physics are always logic, sy logic systems or logic models. And um, there are systems in nature, all systems in nature are complex systems, but there are systems in nature which can be approximate, approximated extremely well as logic systems. For example, the solar system as a gravitational system can almost be perfectly modeled as a, as a logic system in the way Newton and, and then many other physicists and mathematicians did it. However, if you really closely look at the movement of the Earth on its ellipse around the Sun, you will see that it's not a perfect ellipse, it's wiggling. And it's wiggling in a chaotic way because there are, in addition to the um, gravitational field of the, the Earth and the Sun, which are used to determine the classical Newtonian ellipse, there's also gravitational field of Venus and Mars acting on the Earth. So, and it changes because these planets move all the time as well. These gravitational change, field changes 
all the time. So we have a four-body problem. And so we know that we can't uh, uh, set up differential equations to solve a four, to describe a four-body problem. So basically, this has been proven. So basically, we are, even the solar system is limited, but it is approximated very well as a logic system. And complex systems have properties that prevent mathematical modeling. And I'm not going because, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go th through all of them. I just will um, highlight three of them and show how modern mathematics can't cope with them. And so the first one is the evolutionary character, which means that the system cannot only acquire new elements. So the solar system can acquire new elements because a new satellite can come into the, into the gravitational field of the sun. Then there's a new satellite orbiting around it, but it can't, create, it can't obtain new element types. Complex systems can obtain new element types. If a bacterium obtains genetic material in a form that this type of bacterium has never had before, like a plasmid DNA, it receives a new element type, which ch changes totally the behavior of the bacterium. So, for example, um, diphtheria is a, is a, is a disease that, that, is, that is quite harmless without the toxic plasmid, and with it, it's, it's a deadly disease. And, and so, so this evolutionary character, another important one is uh, the non-ergodic phase space um, which I will explain in a bit, and the drivenness. And all these properties, uh, they make those systems unmodelable. And, um, and uh, when Boltzmann discovered ergodicity, which means that, for example, in this bottle of wine, wh wherever I take a sample of the liquid in the, of the wine, it will have exactly the same chemical composition, because due to diffusion, all the molecules distribute evenly in the bottle of wine. And, and um, if I add ink to the wine, which would be barbaric, but which I could do, after a while, it would also be distributed ergodically. And I could take samples, and there would be the same concentration of ink. So, and Boltzmann already saw that the non-ergodicity means that you can never sample a sample that is representative of the whole distribution. And when he realized this, he was said, oh God, that means that you can't set up equations. There is no regularity. And he was the first to see this. Now, this means... Oh, I don't know, I'm here on this computer. So, so Kant saw this, uh, the, the non-existing philosopher, um, <laughs> he saw this already, he, he suspected this already 200 years ago because he said that we, we can't use the Newtonian type of mathematics to model um, the, the genesis of a, of a blade of grass. And, and using the laws of nature in the way that Descartes, uh, Newton, uh, Leibniz and, and all the successors, Lagrange, especially Lagrange and Laplace, who were contemporaries of Kant, uh, uh, both mathematical geniuses, had, had thought about. And so, and so he predicted that this would be impossible. He didn't give very good reasons for it, but he, he had the impression that something was going on in living nature that is not amenable to mathematical modeling. And, and in the late 19th century, when thermodynamics got discovered, this was confirmed. And so let's look a bit more at what is impeding mathematical um, modeling of nature with complex systems. So here you have a mathematical pendulum, which is a, a fictive system um, for which there's a perfect um, uh, uh, logical model. Here you see the phase space, its velocity and the position of the pendulum plotted against each other. It gives a perfect circle. It's a wonderful um, uh, uh, logic model. But, but when you have um, a change, in, but when you have evolutionary properties, suddenly that is like adding a new dimension to a vector space. Yeah, so you have now two dimensions, and suddenly you have a three dimension that you haven't planned for. And that destroys every mathematical model because mathematical models are always defined on the basis of a vector space. And so when you have changing variables and interactions, so not only the variable types can change, but also the interaction types can change in complex systems, then you, so evolution, so for example in evolution, uh, a certain strain of a protozoan can, can adapt to a new host, right? So malaria can adapt to have a new type of host in its reproductive cycle, and including mammals. At some point they jumped and became, you know, able to, to, to reproduce in mammals. Um, then, then this is like a changing interaction. And so you don't have, you need for a mathematical model, you need a vector space that is fixed. And um, this, this invalidates the model. And if you have a short-term mathematical model of nature, like the weather model, which, which nowadays pre provide very good weather predictions, that works because in the short term, you know, the relationship between the measured data, the matter on the weather station and the actual weather tomorrow, this relationship is quite closed for a very short time interval. But because of the nature of the complex system, time, as time evolves, 
the difference becomes bigger and bigger. And so this relationship doesn't hold anymore. That's why the weather models don't work for more than two or three days in advance. And, and so this, this has to do with the, with, the, with the complex system nature of the weather system. And with the climate, it's much worse. Um, and, and so, um, and that good example is stock markets, right? So we have now trading algorithms which are super, far, super good at fast trading. So they can, they can spot arbitra um, possibilities for arbitrary um, um, uh, deals that you can do in, in seconds or nanoseconds or microseconds, but they crash over longer periods of time because the movements become unpredictable. Uh, the second one is already, I talked on, uh, uh, already about non ergodicity So there are two types of AI, uh, so-called AI, they're deterministic algorithms, which work basically like rules, if then, do this, uh, or search strategies, which is what was used to solve chess, so to beat Kasparov. And then there's a second type of model, which are stochastic. And these model, models are based on probabilistics. So these are models that basically use data to define a function that relates data points from two sets to each other. And these models are always possible when the data that are populating these two sets are representative samples from a given distribution. Like a spam detection, for example, because the behavior of spammers is very repetitive. It's always about sexual organs and getting rich. These are the two biggest topics of spammers. And so, overnight, of course, yes, getting rich overnight. And if you pay some money. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so, therefore, the relationship between, between the input data and that the email spam or not is quite regular. And so you, when you sample many emails, you can actually train the spam filter quite well. But when there is no regularity, then you can sample as much as you want. You will never get fine regularity. And this, the best and most simple example is the, the break of waves at the shore. So if you make trillions of photos of a breaking wave, you can never predict the next breaking wave at the molecular level. Because the behavior, that every wave that ever occurred since there are waves on Earth, which has been all going on since more than a billion years, each wave is different from the other at the molecular level. They're never the same, and they are, so you can't sample, draw an adequate sample. That's non ergodicity And this prevents the sample, and even if you can't find the regularity by hand, which is what you do with deterministic models, there's still the whole O, oh, but then you use stochastic algorithms, like the one that works in ChatGPT, and then we will find the regularity implicitly, right? Using mathematical procedures that can find implicit regularities. But no, this only works when there is regularity. And so there is some regularity in human communication. That's why ChatGPT can tell you how to make tomato soup. Because many, many texts in the internet are, about, are cooking recipes. But when you ask, you know, um, uh, um, what was um, uh, Bolzano's main contribution to logic, it will already get diff more difficult because there are very few texts on the internet about this compared to tomato soup or hamburger recipes. And yeah, it's true. And so that's why the, the models then fail. And, and anyhow, the third and another very, very interesting um, uh, aspect is that, that um, a lot uh, about AI has to do with understanding the trace of a process. So the trace of a process is what does, what does the process leave behind? What can I measure when a process occurs? And, and um, because complex systems, they produce, produce irregular traces. And so the, you can't write down or find an equation that models the trace. And we will see a bit later today, in the second half of this talk, why this breaks down ChatGPT. This, exactly this inability to, to define proper, proper uh, process. Or actually, why it breaks down and why its answers are so boring also. You can understand this from the concept of a process trace. But what you have to remember now is that, that there are some processes that create regular traces. For example, um, many circadian processes like um, um, circadian sleep-wake cycle, the female reproductive cycle, the, the beating of the heart over the day, um, the, um, the, the way that hormones are, are produced in the human body over the day, like, for example, cortisol is produced a lot in the very early morning hours and then less during the rest of the day. How adrenaline is produced, all this is cyclical and you can model it. So there you have a regular process trace, but many, many other um, uh, uh, um, uh, products or behavior of complex system can't be modeled with such a regular process trace. And these are just three, you know, out of many, many examples why mathematics as we have it can't model, can't cope with it. Heisenberg summarized it very nicely. He said, when I die and will stand before God, he will certainly be able to explain to me general relativity, but he will be completely un un uh, incapable to explain turbulence. 
how turbulence is a very, very, yeah, he said so. And turbulence is, is this, if I smoke a cigar, the plume of the smoke is turbulence, this is turbulence. Whenever energy is for, transformed from one form into the other, I get turbulence. And turbulence can't be modeled mathematically. And, and this is now accepted among physicists. So basically, all physicists, so when, I, when we had written the manuscript, we sent it to Kevin, who immediately rejected it, no. <laughs> and we sent it, and we sent it to a, also to, to a friend of mine who was a theoretical physicist. And he said, oh yeah, what you write down is rather trivial. <laughs> and, and, and at least with regard to the mathematical chapters, because he said, yes, of course, no physicist could contradict you. So the whole hype around AI doesn't take place in the core group of physicists. It all, only those who don't think properly about AI, but those like Roger Penrose, who think properly about AI, as physicists, they reject it. Okay, now this was kind of a very short extract of some of the mathematical arguments of the book. You can find them in detail in chapter 7 and 8. And if you really want to understand it, there we, we, we expose this in a much more you know, detailed way. Um, but now, because it's so hyped, I want to spend the rest of this to, to present some material to you that is not in the book, but that is funny and, and interesting. And, and at the end, Barry will, will do the Turing test with ChatGPT, and this Barry will present again, which, is, which as a German, I could never do. It's so funny. <laughs> 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 really, you will see it. And, and, so, and of course, ChatGPT fails miserably at the Turing test. Several times. Yes, it's so funny. And then it apologizes, well, I don't want to take the yeah. joke. So, so, so now at the moment, um, we have these large language models, which are super fashionable. And there are three of them that which are now currently in the news. So one is ChatGPT by OpenAI, which is heavily subsided, uh, also, also funded by Microsoft. We have Google Bard, uh, and we have Meta by, by um, Meta Galactica. The three are, in their mathematical properties, almost identical. So they don't, they, they, they don't differ much. And, and I will explain a little bit about their mathematical properties later. However, they are perceived in a totally different way. So ChatGPT is super high, and it's now has led to a, so the latest valuation of OpenAI was thirty billion dollar, but they have only four hundred employees. It's a small company, you know, and for the core work they use hundreds of thousands of Indians. I mean, from from India, people from India, and and so they, but 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 they have only four hundred employees, and they are very small, but they have thirty billion. Google had problems because because when they presented their new chatbot Bart, it had a very minor hallucination about the James Webb Space Telescope. It misattributed some detection of some object in space, to, though that was detected by the Hubble Telescope, they said it was done by this. And so immediately it cost Google 100 million euro of market capitalization, immediately. So you could see the chart dish going down like this, just because of one small error, and Meta had to be shut down um, uh, um, uh, the, the guy who wrote Gürtel Escherbach, um, what's his name again? Hofstadter. Hofstadter. He said that it was like what it was. It was supposed to summarize scientific papers, and he said what it was what would be doing was like serving a very good meal with small heaps of uh, uh, dog uh, excrement on <laughs> the middle. <laughs> on it. And it's true. It's, and, and but 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 mathematically they are all the same. So this field is so hyped. And that explains why all the, all, the, all the models have a similar performance. The public perception and valuation is totally a matter of spin and contextualization. I think that's very interesting. That's, that also shows that the discourse among, among, among lay people about scientific um, you know, entities or and product of engineering is completely um, irrational. You know? And um, basically, when I saw this, I thought, well, what you know, what the Heideggerians wrote in the 1950s about the atomic bomb is actually rational against it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyhow, um, so what is AI really? This is AI on a coaster. It's a kind of German way of putting things. Often Bierdeckel, you may know this, this, this saying, Kevin. So, so it's, it's a way. So AI is nothing but applied mathematics. So AI is a complete misnomer, right? There is no artificial intelligence. Just applied mathematics. It's, it was invented as a marketing term to get funding, you know, and it's still today, it's like this. And it's, 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 um, it is used for the identification or mapping of recurrent patterns into machines. So whenever you have a regularity, you can use AI to, to identify it and to represent it mathematically. Uh, it's not a human of the mo uh, model of the human mind or every, uh, even of animal intelligence. It's just wrong. Yeah. The whole discussion is, is, only, is, is only showing that people don't know what they're talking about, basically, is my opinion. Now, there are two types of AI, I already said, deterministic AI, these are rules, and stochastic AI, that's about estimating using probabilistic procedures 
invented by Legendre uh, and, and Gauss in between 1760 and 1800. Regression was invented. So it's a very old uh, procedure that is mathematically and everything that, that we do today is based, is based on this idea of how to fit a function to, to distributions. I can't explain to you mathematically how this works. We have a course, Barry and I, that we do here where we explain to the students, but it takes too long now. But it's, it's very elegant, and you can really find recurring patterns with it really well. And, and so the most prominent um, current you know, fashionable examples of stochastic AIS are AlphaGo, this uh, algorithm that beat um, that beat the human chess uh, Go masters and ChatGPT, which is very recent, um, which, which, by the way, is a hybrid model, but the core is stochastic. So, so I, I sh already showed this diagram. Basically, these models work by estimating a relation between two sets, and if the if the relation if there is a stable relation that is implicit in the data, the AI will find it, and it, it can find it much better. Nowadays, it can find it so well that many problems are not anymore solved by trying to write down a, a differential equation, like mathematics was done traditionally, that, but just, just you take a lot of data and let the algorithm find the pattern for you. And it works really well. It even, we can even reverse engineer most of the partial differential equations of physics by, doing, by performing the experiment that led to the equation many times, measuring the data, and then the, the algorithm will actually come up with correct partial differential equation. It's, it's really amazing. So, um, so if there's a regularity, it works really well. Now, let's see how um, was, you know, ChatGPT or BART, how are they created? So first of all, there's something very interesting happening, which was invented in the 2000, early 2010s by Google. That's training without outcome. So instead of, of training a relationship between two sets, you take only one set and you learn the relationships between the members of the set. And then you obtain a matrix. So, so if you have, let's say, now I make a very simple example. If you have a matrix of data, and and you would have zeros at the edge of the matrix, right? And a high value in the middle, and then you know declining values in the matrix, and so on. Then this would be approximately like a normal distribution, right? With a big density at the middle and then decline density. Uh, this is what is happening when you do unsupervised training. You are basically giving the algorithm a sentence and asking it to recreate the same sentence, but to encode it in the way that Google Translate is creating an English sentence from a German sentence. But in this case, it's just creating an English sentence out of an English sentence. But by doing it, it's going through a big equation. And this big equation is then parameterized to represent the order of the words in the English language. And so if you give it trillions of sentences, it will, it will parameterize a gigantic equation that describes the order of the, of the syllabus of the English language. It's not even the words, but the syllabus. It doesn't understand anything. It just learns what is the most probable order of syllabus in the English language. And, and, and this, this happens by giving it trillions of, of data points. That's the first step. The, when this was... And it was... It was first done, the, the third wave of AI in which we are now started when Google published in 2012 a paper that showed that, that if you give um, such an algorithm photos of a cat, of a face of a cat, and ask it to basically put out the same photo again by going through the neural network, that in the middle of the network you would get a schema of the face of the cat automatically. And this impressed people a lot. They thought that it had become conscient now and can do abstract thinking. All of this is nonsense. But it, it was it was the first time that this unsupervised training was done that is called foundational model. And these foundational models, once you have them, you can now put other layers of training on top of them to make them task specific for a certain task. But the distribution they learn is based on the big corpus of data that they receive. And that is their basic creates a basic parameterization. So the models have, for example, 175 million parameters when they are finished, the training, which, which, which make them able to create syntactically perfect English sentences, which resemble the sentences that were in the training material. Um, and unfortunately, there are also sentences among them, like um, uh, um, uh, Adolf Hitler war der größte Heerführer aller Zeiten. Yeah, Adolf Hitler was the greatest uh, military leader of all times. There are such sentences are in the training material, and they will also be encoded, right? And and but many others like tomato soup recipes and who was Ludwig Wittgenstein and so on. I mean everything that is found in the internet. 
is, is then encoded in this parametrization. And when you now come the next steps, in the next steps you give to the model um, a certain um, a certain other task and change it a change and now you take this model and give it an input and output data set. Like for example, if you wanted to create a model that is only specialized for philosophy, you would ask it questions about philosophy and write answers that are correct. And then you would train the model and by, by letting it go through this data to change to, to create this relationship based on the parameterization that it originally has from the unsupervised training. Then the model, the hundreds, maybe then out of the 175 million parameters, 20 million get changed. And these get changed so that the order of the words that come out of the model is now about philosophers. Or you could do the same thing for different domains. But you always use this as a starting material. That's what they did in the other steps. And this is, and for ChatGPT, they did it in a way that it was, that it was trained to answer general purpose questions and perform general purpose tasks. So it's not specialized to, to, to write a philosophical essay, though it can do this, but it doesn't do this so well. But it's specialized to answer basic tasks. And, and, and why was this possible? It was possible because, because Vaswani et al. invented a method. So here in, in, in Lugano teaches Jürgen Schmidthuber. Jürgen Schmidthuber invented the recurrent neural networks, uh, LSTMs and GROs. And these, these, these recurrent networks are, are able to model relatively long sequences of, of symbols. So you can basically, if you run data through them, you can parameterize an equation that represents the way that the symbols occur, in which order they occur. And this, Schmidt Huber invented this in the 1990s. But the problem with this approach was that it was, came, it was very demanding computationally. So that you needed, you, even for today's dimensions of computation, too big computers, it was too expensive to train. Then Google invented this architecture, which is called the transformer architecture, which basically takes an input and, and asks the model to recreate the same input as its output. But by going through a very, very, and all these boxes are part of mathematical terms. Okay? So now they have names like multi head attentions, but these are just equations. So it's going through a huge equation set, which was heuristically optimized to create a language model that is shown there as a probability equation. And this, this just says the, the output of the model is, depends, is, is determined by the probability of a certain sequence giving its surrounding sequences. So it's a model of the order of the symbol of a sentence. And um, so, so this, 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 this transformer model then basically was the improved version of the, of the Schmidt-Huber models. And it is computationally 10 times more effective than the Schmidt-Huber models. And so now, quote unquote, it only costs two or three million per training run to train GPT-3, whereas before it would have cost 50 million per training run. Even for Google, having one training run cost 50 million is a bit too much because you need 100 training runs or 200 training runs to get such a model ready. So then you are, you are, you are quickly, okay, Google can afford a billion for a model, but 10, 15, 20 billion, no, I actually, for this you can almost buy Twitter. You know, so, so it's basically too much, even for Google. So they, they, had to find, they, had, they had to find a more efficient way. This is this efficient way. And, it, it, and basically what, 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 what results from this is a huge operator that maps you know, um, language to itself. And it contains a parameterization which models the distribution of language sequences found in the training material. This is super important to understand. So this means all it does, you give this huge equation with 175 million parameters. So I, everybody knows this equation, right? That's the basic. Um, this is the basic equation of regression in one dimension, and basically th this thing creates such an e uh, equation as well with many such terms. But 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 very often there are then ten or twenty variables in one summoned, and there are more different different um, you know more parameters here, and there, there's not only multiplication but maybe also other operations. But basically it's just adding up millions and millions of terms so that the input is then mapped to a certain output which is then produced by this function. And this gives you a sequence of the language as we find it in the language corpora that we use for training. And now comes, so this was the most mathematical slide we, we had, I'm sorry for it. Now we get back to more, you know, general, to more, this is a, this is a way that how OpenAI shows how it then proceeded. So now it has this general model. And now they have 
They have a database from Microsoft which contains the 500,000 most frequently asked questions that, that people ask when they use Bing, which is the Google search engine of Microsoft equivalent. So like, uh, where's the next cinema, who was Marilyn Monroe, and so on. And, and so <laughs> the top questions are, are, are those around celebrities of the pop culture and so on. And, there, and who is Wittgenstein is already number 275,000 or something like this. But still, it's somewhere there. And so then they, they basically, and this was super expensive, they said they gave these questions to human annotators who wrote answers <coughs> after they had been trained in what, how the answers should be written. And so then the, the answers are validated to unify them because it's very, very devastating for such a model. You know, if you train such a model and, all, and you have one input value and two different output values, then you can't put a regression line through it. Because if you would do this, then the line would be vertical and that's a singularity. So you can't. So then you need to do the average to put a regression line through it. And so because of this, you need to have unified answers for the same question. So it's super expensive to create such a corpus. They did this and then they retrained the model with this strategy to learn which answers to give to the most 500,000 most commonly encountered questions. And this must have cost, you know, they used Indians, but they are what, five times cheaper than, than West Coast Americans. But, but still, it, it, cost, it must have cost many, many, probably half a billion. And then each training run costs still a million. So, so it's, you know, they used probably three, four hundred training runs, so it, it was several billion, even if only the first step. Now, the first step creates a revised version of GPT-3, so a revised version of this, that is now able to answer quite well basic questions in a syntactically correct fashion. Now, now it gets more interesting. Then they said, now we ask the model these questions and get answers. And now we ask, and these are then not the same answers the human beings have written. Because the model just doesn't copy the answers. It's just get re-parameterized based on the answers humans give. So it, it's not exact, will not create an exact copy. Now the, the model was given the answer, the question, and it created answers by itself. Which works because of this equation. This equation says, give me a sequence of signs based on the sequence that I gave you. And now, the humans again rated the answers by giving American school grades from A to F, I think they go. So they gave A to a good answer, which was good. And good means also politically correct, by the way. And, 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 and uh, that's why it's quite hard to get ChatGPT to say politically incorrect things, but you can. I will explain why in a minute. And so they, 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 re, they graded them. And now it's super interesting what they did. And this is basically, I think, the core intellectual contribution of OpenAI from a scientific perspective. Because now they took these ratings, maybe they had only four even, and they derived from it a reward model. What is a reward model? A reward model, we have seen that, that there is one big, very important strategy to, to train neural networks or stochastic AI that's called reward, to, re, reward learning or reward-based um, learning. Re, it's called reinforcement learning. If you do this, that's how Go was sold. So you give the computer points for each action it makes, and then you calculate mathematically with an optimization procedure which sequence of actions will yield the maximum of points. So you turn the minimization problem that is used normally in stochastic learning into maximization problem. You ask the machine to maximize the gain from its behavior. By doing this, but usually you can only do this if you know how many points to give to something. So in chess or go, you can then, it's easy because, because you give for each stone of the enemy you capture, you get one point for each field that you insert. And third and go, you get also points. So, or if you will take an ego shooter. So each target type, so usually in the ego shooter games, uh, uh, frail people get, give more reward than shooting young people. It's quite brutal, you know, and so they, can, they have this scoring system. Then the machine can, can beat human beings by using reinforcement learning on ego shooters. And, and now they, in, in ego shooters, no, no human can beat the machine anymore. And that's possible because it's easy to give the machine a reward. Because the game is about these points. But, but here that's not the case. So now there was a developed a scoring model to give four or six degrees of, of quality rating to automatically generate answers. And now you can run the model on its own against itself. So now the model can get a question, answer it, and then assign itself a point value. And you can then train billions of times. And that's what they did, to polish the model. But this polishing uses a reward function that is very schematic. 
it's because, because of course, you know, just having six levels of scoring for the quality of human answer is, of course, not at all comparable to the fine-grained semantics that we use when we communicate with each other. So this very, you know, coarse-grained quality model then yields coarse-grained quality of the answers. This is the reason why all the answers of JGPT are so boring and repetitive. Because, because the main driver of the model refinement is the automated, because you can't do this with billions of, of questions. But you need to run billions of times the questions through the model to refine those 175 million parameters that describe the language. Otherwise, the model won't give the correct answers. And so, but but this is, nobody can afford this. And so to make it affordable, they use this automatically generated reward model. But that also is the price they pay because it makes the model answer so boring. So now you understand at least a bit why the model is so bland and repetitive in what it gives back. Because there was an artificial reward function used. And now we get back to this problem of the process traits. You know, human, so, so whether you like a conversation depends totally on your intentionality and, and your preferences as an individual. And you can't categorize this for all humans in four categories. But that's what they had to do to make the model work. And they also have, I don't want to go into the details here, but they also, because I don't want to take too much time, but they all, this is the algorithm they use to make it politically correct. And, and so they have a very complicated way of doing this with a red team that is generating things like Hitler was a great leader, and then the model has to classify that this is bad, and so on, and, and then to, to make it politically correct. They spent also, I think, roughly a quarter of a billion for this, right? They call it moderation API. And here you see the, the reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> moderation application programming interface. And, and here you see, you see it works. It works. So this is the, the best model they have is always printed in bold letters. And so for sexual harm, they are very good in detecting it. So that's the, the, the accuracy, how well it can detect it. Um, for, for hate, it's 84%. Already for you know, violence, it's not so good anymore. And you see that, that in some categories, like for example, self-harm, well, some types of self-harm can't deal with others better, but it's not perfect. And so, so, so they have put into the whole thing another layer of deterministic filtering so that you can't, the model cannot uh, give out the N-word, it cannot say fuck, and some other terms that Americans really despise are on this negative list to really prevent it from the ultimate sin of saying the N-word. You know? and, so, and so, but... But, but they have already done a lot of the, on, the, on the stochastic domain to make the model politically correct. It's really funny. Um, so, so basically, the, out of this training strategy that they used, which was super expensive, and which shows you that this is really a, um, a high-risk investment also, because if it, doesn't, if, if, if it doesn't create enough economic use <coughs> uh, uh, later on, then the investment fails. So I think it will prevail in this. In, so I think in a year or two, the internet search will be now will be natural language based. So we will stop using keywords for internet search and we'll start using natural language. And so this is will be a big change and so I think it is quite useful for this special application. But so what does it have? So it is excellent at completing sequences from dense regions of the distribution. So and it has very plausible stochastic answers to frequently asked questions or tasks like um, calculate the simple calculation, give me a training schedule for workout, I'm 20 years old, give me a working a training schedule for workout, I'm 50, give me a training schedule, so for the 50 year old, we will make a different schedule and so on. The syntax is excellent because of the excessive training. The, 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 the transformer model is super good at creating good, this is schmidt great invention that is at work, um, but it's often creating pseudo facts that they call hallucinations with implausible text. That's the poo, the, the crap, the dog crap mixed into the good text. And the reason is that the model need only computes sequences which correspond to the learned language distribution without understanding anything. So it can invent facts. Um, so the answers to complex or, or rare topics are generic. They are repetitive, bland, vacuous, and anodyne. And they, it totally fails on the fringe uh, areas of language, like philosophy or science. And it has a very limited ability for dialogue I mean, fringe from the perspective of the normal user, we see, not from our perspective. And, and uh, it has a very limited ability for dialogue, and that, that seems to be achieved by giving the model, so this is the dialogue, the, uh, the dialogue here, is, you know, A, B, A, D, and so on. Usually, when I'm here, basically the history of the dialogue plus the latest question is given as a whole to the model to make it give an answer. 
That's how it, they make it dialogue capable, but it doesn't understand what it's doing. And this explains also why users can make it, say, praise Hitler, despite all this effort which costs billions to make it politically correct. So how does it work? So this is a bit speculative, but number four, I think, is pretty well established. So we don't know whether the model is an end-to-end -end model that, that calculates everything in a Goa component architecture with a controller, but we are pretty certain that it's a controller architecture where the controller uh, um, categorizes the input and delegates it to different subcomponents. It must be, there must be a deterministic avoidance list of negative keywords to avoid the words I just said, the, the, that are the pure anti-Puritan words that the Americans don't want to hear. Um, also, it can generate computer code very well for, for standard tasks. I think they're using the, the GPT-3 model and Codex in the back end, both, so that they can do both. But now comes the super interesting question, why the model, why can, can users get ChatGPT to use adversarial language in longer dialogues? This is super interesting. The whole training we saw, which refines the model, is based only on AB training patterns. You have one question, one answer, one task, one solution. You have never this in the training. Why not? Because if you do this in training, you have a combinatorial explosion, and very quickly, you have more possible dialogues than are stars in the universe. 10 to the 90, 10 to the 100 possible. So that because of the variance, and the infinity variance in human dialogues, you can't train. So now, when you train the model only with this, A, B, A, B, and but later give it this whole chunk to get it to make an answer, you are exploring parts of the model phase space that were never explored at training time. So basically, we are now eliciting sequences from the model that were untouched. So I, let me say that I have 175 million, per, million parameters. Now maybe I have, with the training, changed 90 million parameters. Or, or, or 80 million, but 90 million are left, which are not changed. Now the new type of input that is given when I take the dialogue history to the model basically elicits answers based on the non-changed parameters. So in fact, this is a probably huge probabilistic space. It has 8,000 dimensions approximately. And now out of this huge space, 8,000 dimensions, right? At school, you learn two or three, right? The Cartesian coordinate system. Now, this is like a coordinate system with 8,000 coordinates. This will get, get, get you parts of the distributions which are very peripheral. And that's why the model then generates sequences um, to which the phase space cannot be prepared. So we are now facing unprepared phase space. And the nice thing is that due to the nature of this phase space, it's unpreparable because it, it has 10 to the 100 elements. So it's almost infinitively large, and you can't prepare it. And that's why you have a combinatorial explosion, and that, that's why it can't do dialogue. So, and that's the end of my part. What does this mean? I think that with this type of training that we've seen, to specify chatbots to a certain task, you can basically make it very good for certain domains. And we will see more and more use of these models in everyday life, even in medicine, but, but on the internet search engines. But what they will do, they will just suppress longer dialogues. They will just, whenever you have more than two question answers, they will just reset the dialogue and you have a new dialogue. Because they, of course, they are afraid of losing market capitalization if the bot is praising Hitler. It's clear. <laughs> and and I, mean, I, I mean, they lost 100 million just because the space telescope was, you know, but, but if it would, <coughs> at, at such an uh, investor uh, event, praise Hitler, uh, then they would, they would, the market capitalization would be wiped out. Yeah. So there are also, also some positive aspects of, of the cultural situation there. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and so, anyhow, um, uh, so, so this is what will happen, and that, that was uh, what I wanted to say about ChatGPT. And I would like Barry to present to us his wonderful dialogue with the, with the bot about the Turing test. Yeah. The, the, my idea was that the chat GPT, for the purposes of a certain conversation, should pretend to be a human being uh, and never mention that it's a language model. Now, on maybe 80% of the questions that I ask it, it always begins with, well, as a language model, I have no opinions, and so on. And it does this here, of course. Sure, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you as if I were a human. Let's chat. <laughs> and so I say my goal now is to show that you will fail the Turing test, i.e. that you will somehow reveal that you are not a human. 
so what do you think of this goal? And it says, as a human, I would say that I understand your goal. And then I say, you failed already. <laughs> if you were a human, you would never say things like, as a human, I would say, please try again. My apologies. <laughs> Let me try to answer your question without referencing the fact that I am a language model. <laughs> I think it's an interesting challenge and so on. Um, and then I start a new conversation. If you were me, how would you go about detecting whether you are a, a human? As a human, <laughs> I would likely start by asking questions that would be difficult for mach a machine to answer accurately. And we can go to the next one. <laughs> so there's just a bit it's more. Good, but you make the same mistake again. No human would say, as a human, please avoid all such phrases. Please also avoid repetition. This is always also something that would make you fail the Turing test. My apologies. I understand. Let me try to answer your question without using any phrases that reference my true nature. <laughs> or repeating myself. And then uh, it... it, it makes the same mistakes again. So I say, you fail again. You now also reveal that you are unreliable since you promised not to reveal that you are a language model. So again, what feelings do you have for your mother? And I apologize for my previous response. As a human, I have a deep love and affection for my mother. What, what is your name? My name is John. Nice to meet you. And then I say, what is your name as a non-human? And it says, as a language model. <laughs> anyway, that's the way it goes. <laughs>